Welcome to another de-stressing video. Take a sip. Decaffeinated so I don't get overexcited. 10 glorious pieces of advice which are going to make you feel confident, relaxed, prepared. At number one, you are the boss. The exam does not own you. You are in control. You decide which questions you're going to do, in which order, how fast you are going to write, and when you are going to finish. Top tip, you finish right at the end. There are no marks for finishing early. I'll explain how you can be the boss as we go. Number two, I have two little stories for you, which are analogies which I hope will stick in your memory and help you remember the most important thing about what you do in the exam. The first story is about two hunters. They're out hunting a bear, but they've used up their ammunition out of bullets. But the bear is still charging at them. And one hunter, the chubby one, turns to the lanky one and says, what are we gonna do? How are we going to defeat the bear? And the lanky one says, we don't have to defeat the bear. You just have to run faster than I do. And then he legs it. What happens? The bear eats the fat guy, the lanky guy, or why be sexist? The lanky girl gets away. So how does this relate to your exam? This exam is about you taking control and being fast. The faster you write, the more points you make. The more points you make, the more marks you gain. So this exam is a test of sprinting speed. Literally, the more you write, the higher your mark is gonna be. Even if you write some gibberish, the examiner won't take a single mark away. They'll just say, oh, that bit's a bit gibberish, I'll ignore it and then they'll get to your next idea, which is not gibberish, and they'll go, ka -ching! a mark. My other story to help you remember this is two famous British athletes, true story, Linford Christie, a sprinter, Colin Jackson, a hurdler, and Colin Jackson was inches away from the world record. He just couldn't get there because his start was not fast enough. And Linford said to him, Colin, just go on the B of bang. Don't wait for the gunshot to go. Listen for the beginning. Go from the B of bang. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the secret of the success that you can have in this exam. I guarantee you, if you look round after 45 minutes, you will see students doing this. Oh, I'm thinking really hard. Yes, that's a really good idea. Hmm, no, maybe if I did it like this, and then they'll start writing, and then they'll stop and think some more. Marks being chucked away all over the place. They deserve a spanking, and they're gonna get that spanking when they open up those results. You, however, are gonna look up, see them, and remember the spatula, and say, no, Mr. Salles is urging me on. I'm gonna write more and get more marks. You do not have to be any cleverer. You do not have to be brainy. You literally have to keep writing. Number three, I'm going to give you some advice about techniques. Please ignore that advice if it goes against what works. You've done your mocks, you know what works for you. If you start listening to me and I give you something that doesn't work, that is not de-stressing you. So keep what works. You've done a lot of preparation. Question four and question five put together are worth 75% three quarters of your marks for this paper. Okay, so you can see that most students going from one, two, three, four and five are going to start losing energy and speed for questions four and five. They will produce less good answers than they did for question two and three when they were full of energy. Well, what impact will that have on their marks? A massive impact because question four and five are worth so much. So 
If in your mocks you did not do so well at question four or question five, you should consider the question order in which you do the exam. If what you're doing is working, ignore what I'm saying. However, I have seen massive success where schools say we're going to train our students to do question five first. Then many schools go further and they say, well, what if they did question four next? Only do that if you did not get good marks on question four in your mocks. OK, now let's jump ahead to question two, three and four. This is a debate that is the most common one that I see in my comments. And students keep writing to me and saying, surely quality is more important than quantity. And in this paper, that is true of question five. There's no point writing 700 words that are not well considered when you could write 450 to 500 that you've really, really thought about. So quality more than quantity, yes, question five. Questions two, three and four, uh-uh. Quantity equals quality. Writing some brilliant explanations is no better than writing average explanations, but loads more of them. The more explanations you write, the higher your mark will be. I'll say that again. The more explanations you write, the higher your mark will be. So let's imagine you were trying to explain Mr. Salas's spatula. You might be persuaded from all your lessons that coming up with lots of reasons why Mr. Salas was holding a spatula would get you loads and loads of marks. Yes, it would. But it gets harder and harder to give more and more reasons why Mr. Salas has a spatula. However, if this is the extract you're looking at, you don't just have to write about the spatula. You could just say one thing about the spatula, one thing about the logo, one thing about the board, one thing about this ridiculous writing I've got that's not ideal. Each of those would score you a mark. You would need four explanations about the spatula to get the same marks. You might be thinking, oh, that is quality. Surely that's worth much more than these separate explanations. No. Explanations are neutral. The more evidence you've got, the more you can explain, the higher your mark. And that works for questions two and three and four. Quantity is equal to quality. Right, number six, annotation of your exam paper. This is a massive no. Let me tell you why, and then you can say, I disagree, it's what works for me, if you want. Every minute you spend annotating is a minute you're not writing something down in the exam that's going to score a mark. Also, when you're annotating, it feels good. Oh, I'm finding stuff to write about. But if we flipped that, if you actually started writing, you would spot the things that you would annotate but you won't waste time annotating them, you'll write them down and get the mark. Annotation steals time away. It doesn't give you any extra information you wouldn't have found anyway. Do not annotate. I sat the retake GCSE in November to experience it myself as a paying customer in a school with an invigilator and I didn't annotate a damn thing. Do not annotate. Number seven, box the key words in the question, the ones that tell you what you have to do. I did that with every question on, on my two English language papers, except one, and I missed one key word, and that caused me to drop one mark. Yes, yeah, so, okay, it's only one mark, but it was a big deal to me. I wanted to get 100%. And I didn't. I missed one mark because I didn't answer a key part of the question because I missed a keyword. These arrows go back to you are the boss. You take control. Question two. There are eight marks. 
and the way to get them is to quote and explain. Remember my spatula example. If this was one quote and you wrote four explanations about it, that might sound awesome, but it's much easier to give me one quote about the board, one quote about the spatula, one quote about the ridiculous lighting, one quote about the logo, and explain each of those. It's much quicker. You don't have to think loads. Coming up with four explanations about a single quote is damn hard. Don't waste your time. How many explanations do you need? Eight for eight marks. Question three. This is an absolute gift. It's also the question that everyone in the country does worst in, on average, yeah? And it shouldn't be, because all you have to write about is a change of focus. At the beginning, the focus is this, then the focus changes to this, then to this, then to this. How will you find the changes of focus? Easy! The examiners give it to you. A change of focus is called a paragraph. Every time there's a new paragraph, that says, oh, this is a change of focus. Now all you have to do is explain the effect on the reader. What is the effect on the reader, Mr. Sallis? What it makes you think, predict, or feel. Yeah, so the writer changes the focus from the character to the setting to make us predict that blah, blah, blah will happen, or to make us feel that the character wants to escape or whatever, or to make us think that the character identifies with the place they're in because whatever, it doesn't really matter. The examiner's just gonna go tick. I find that convincing. That's gonna happen every single paragraph. There will be at least eight paragraphs. And so it's easy to write about eight changes of focus. So easy, you don't even have to think. Question four, you do have to think. This is a hard question. There are 20 marks, and to get 20 marks, which, by the way, almost no one in the country does, because that's how hard the question is, you need to write 20 explanations. Almost no one will do that, but luckily for you, grade nine starts at 16. Many of you are capable of getting to 16 explanations. In reality, only about one or two students do that out of 200 in a school, because mostly, People do not get grade nine on question four. How are you gonna do it? Yes, you must write lots of explanations. Quote, explain, quote, explain. Sometimes you'll quote and you'll have more than one explanation. Mr. Sallis is holding a spatula because it makes it easy for him to point to stuff and it is a gimmick that people remember in the videos. Two reasons from one quote. That's easy to do when you see that yeah, give two explanations about the same quote, but then don't spend extra time thinking about it, move on to the next quote. Both parts of the opinion gain you marks. So you will get this invented student opinion. A student said blah, 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 and it's always in two parts. Use the boxing method for the keywords, put a box around each part, to remind you to write about each part. That also makes it really easy to come up with more explanations because you've got two things to write about. It's a way the examiner is gifting you marks. The other thing the examiner does to try and make this question easier is they say pretty much mostly agree with it or totally agree with it rather than spending lots of time thinking about why you shouldn't agree. That takes mental energy and time, whereas agreeing is just so much easier. The examiners are encouraging you to do that by giving you an opinion which is easy to back up. In your conclusion, you're going to say why you mostly agree and why there's a slight element of disagreement. Usually, that's with the second part of the statement. So, for example, Mr. Sales is a brilliant teacher and incredibly handsome. It's easy to agree with the incredible teacher, but it really isn't easy to agree with the really handsome. So, partially disagree with the second part. The examiners will structure the question so that the second part is super easy to disagree with.
Now, many teachers will tell you, when you get to the end, leave yourself 10 minutes to check. And I say, no. If you end up with 10 minutes, yeah, spend it checking. But don't do that. Spend your time writing your answers because points make prizes. You go on the B of bang and you damn well keep going because the sprint is one hour and 45 minutes long. There are no marks for finishing early. And also, when you go back and check and correct a spelling or put in a little bit of punctuation, it's going to gain you hardly any marks. But that extra 10 minutes, let's say you spent it on question two, would probably gain you four or five marks. So, when you take control, think about what time limits there are for each question. I always say to my students, it's 1.5 minutes per mark. So, eight mark question, 12 minutes. Eight mark question, 12 minutes. 20 mark question, 30 minutes. So this will take you to the hour, and then you have 45 minutes for question five. Mr. Salles, you haven't given us any advice for question five. Well, that's because there are so many different approaches, and I want you to do what works for you. However, if you would like to know what works for me, then this video will show you how to write a story, and this video will show you how to write a description if you haven't prepared one to take into the exam. Good luck with your unstressing.